someone somewhere in the U.S. will have a heart attack every minute of every single day. And our goal today is to make sure that you are not one of them. So we have five foods that can help prevent a heart attack. Let's go. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. So here are the numbers. 800,000 people every year in the US will have a heart attack more than 2000 every day more than one every single minute. And the thing is about a quarter of them it won't even be their first heart attack. And we all know that high fat food, fast food, greasy foods, those are big no-nos when it comes to your heart. But today we're flipping the script, we're turning it upside down and we're gonna be talking about the foods that can do the exact opposite and support your heart, make it as healthy as possible so it can beat as happily and as healthfully as possible for many, many years to come. And the man with five of the best for you that will be raising our heart health IQs today, he is one half of the doc and chef. He is also the medical director at the Barnard Medical Center a guy who has worked with some of the most elite athletes on the planet as a team physician in both the National Football League and in Major League Baseball. And oh, what an athlete he is himself. The man has credentials for days. But talk about a guy who can just do it. It's 60 years old, Ironman triathlon competitor. Dr. Jim Loomis is here with us once again today. And if there's a question that you have for Dr. Loomis, drop it in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can when we open up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. But let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Loomis back to the exam room live. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Chuck. How are you? Thanks ha for having me back. It's great to have you here, man. Uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. And I wanted to talk to you about this based off an episode that you and Chef Karen Dugan did recently on The Doc and Chef, where you really looked at heart disease. And so, like, let's narrow the scope here. Let's let's start by talking about heart attacks specifically. We just heard 800,000 people a year minimum in the United States are right. going to have a heart attack. That is a huge, huge, huge number. Right. Um how many of these heart attacks can be prevented, Dr. Loomis? Well, I would I would say that uh, most of them. Now, some of them you have to start at a young age. Uh, the sooner you start to you know adapt a healthier lifestyle, and you know this is especially relevant, by the way, Chuck. Uh, during the holiday season, uh, heart attacks go up by about twenty five percent. Heart attack deaths increase by forty percent. And in fact, December is the deadliest month for heart attacks of, of any month out of the year. So, especially relevant for this holiday season. Okay, well, there's a lot that goes into the holidays. We've got stress and we've got diet. In your opinion, which is the bigger culprit of the two? Well, I think it's a combination of, of everything. You know, it is a stressful month, but in typical, you know, the holiday season, our diets really, really, we all fall off the wagon, all the holiday parties and, and you know, the work parties and, it, you know, the, the fatty foods and the, the desserts and, you know, on and on and on. So I think it's a combination of, of, of stress, but also I, I think it's in a, you know, this kind of acute change, this deterioration in our diets. You know, I didn't even realize this when it comes to heart attacks until this morning. About one in five, according to the CDC, are silent heart attacks. The person really has no idea that they're even even having one until, as the CDC says, the damage is already done. So That's how is it even possible that somebody can be suffering a heart attack and be oblivious to it? Well, it's especially common in diabetics, actually, because, um, you know, one of the complications of diabetes is it can it can adversely affect our nervous system. So it can cause numbness and tingling in our in our hands and feet. So it alters sensation. Well, in theory, it, you can get the same thing with with heart. So when it dulls our kind of pain receptors, um, you can have a heart, a silent heart attack uh, and, and not know it because the, the kind of normal pain and chest pain you get. It gets kind of short circuited. The other thing is people sometimes ignore the symptoms. You know, they, they in retrospect, you know, they were they did have a little shortness of breath going up the hill or climbing the stairs. Uh, you know, they, they were a little more fatigued. But but, you know, because so many people are out of shape and lead a sedentary lifestyle, they don't perceive that as an, as an abnormal you know, symptom, if you will. 
So let's uh, let's get to the help here. Uh, we kind of you know teased five foods that can help. What are your five best when it comes to preventing a heart attack, Doctor Loomis? Give me number one. So I would say legumes, probably number one. Um, you know beans, lentils, and there's a couple of reasons why they're such a powerful tool. So so one is a substitution effect. Uh, if you're getting your your pro your protein, for example, from legumes or beans, you know what else are you getting? You're getting fiber. So fiber has been shown to lower blood pressure, lower blood sugar, uh, you know, lower cholesterol, um, help control weight. Um, you're also getting a ton of antioxidants, uh, especially the darker beans. And, you know, one of the risk factors for, for heart disease is, is high cholesterol. And when we develop oxidative stress, which is a normal response to our bodies, uh, and, and in small doses, it's good, but in high doses, it can actually oxidize the, the LDL particles making it more reactive with the blood vessel wall. Red, dark beans, red beans, um, pinto beans, black beans, very potent antioxidants. And what are you not getting? You're not getting saturated fat. When, so when we get our protein, for example, from chicken or ham or, or, or beef or turkey, um, you know, what else are we getting? We're getting saturated fat, right? And what are we not getting? We're not getting anti antioxidants because antioxidants only occur in plants. We're not getting any fiber because fiber only occurs in plants. So, so part of that benefit, you know, there's there's benefit from directly from the legumes themselves, uh, the phytonutrients that are in the legumes. But also, there's a, a pretty profound substitution effect because again, when we get our when we get our our our, our protein, for example, from, from we're not getting it from meat. We're not exposing ourselves to the saturated fat, which we know is one of the biggest drivers of risk for heart disease. What do you have number two on your list, my friend? I'd say whole grains, um, you know, you know, true whole grains, not, not white flour, you know, such as that, but true whole grains. So whole wheat flour, um, uh, you know, wheat berries, farro, amaranth, um, um, even things like pseudo grains like, like, like quinoa. Again, the key here is the fiber. So fiber, again, has a, a a lot of effects. Now, you do have to be careful with some of the more refined grains, like white flour, for example, uh, where you've taken some of the, the you know, when, when you when you make white flour, what you essentially do is so a whole grain has several components. It has um, what's called the endosperm, which is the, kind of the the germ of or the, the the embryo of the plant. The the, the endosperm, um, uh, I'm sorry, the wheat germ is the is the is the kind of the the seed or the, the where the the embryo of the plant. And the in the wheat the germ has a lot of uh, of healthy fatty uh, omega three fatty acids. We have the bran, which is kind of a protector and covering on top, which is where the fiber is. And the endosperm is where all the carbohydrates live that serve as fuel for the plant till it can take to can take root. And so when we when we take a whole grain and turn it into white flour, for example, we strip off the bran, which is where all the fiber is. We take out the the in the the germ. Because these fatty acids, it, you know, if they're not consumed rapidly, they can go rancid, like oil will go bad. And so they'll spoil, it shortens the shelf life. And so all we're left with is just the sugar component, right? And then we grind that up and we dye it, you know, we, we bleach it white and such. And we actually have to spray vitamins back on it because we threw them all away because we've thrown out, you know, the, the most nutrient, nutritious part of the plants. That's not good because that, you know, that can spike our insulin levels. There's no fiber to damp down. The, the sugar levels and things like that. So that's not what I'm talking about. You'd have to be a little bit careful because of the way that that um, when you're when you're looking for whole grain products, you know, on the shelf, uh, just because of the way the USDA allows food labeling laws, you can still have a fair amount of enriched white flour in a whole grain product. So you really want to be careful and, and look for something that's truly whole grain. Okay, so before we get to number three, it's not lost upon me that number one was legumes, beans, number two, whole grains, both of which healthy amount of carbs here, but there is still a large percentage of the population who equate carbs with something right. that's unhealthy. Right. In terms of just cardiovascular health, how important is it that we have carbs in our diet? Right. So, so that's a great point, Chuck. So, so, you know, I think this is a great example of how we practice Health, uh, nutritional reductionism, right? We, 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 we don't talk about food anymore. We talk about foods made out of, right? And if you think about it, 30, 40 years ago, we were worshiping carbs and we were demonizing fat. That was kind of the era of snack wells cookies, right? Fat free is like free food, which by the way, coincides with, with the, um, you know, the kind of the beginning of the epidemic, uh, obesity epidemic in the, in the early eighties. You know, today we're demonizing carbs or worshiping proteins, but carbs aren't the problem, right? 
It's the package the carbs come in. So, you know, think about a, a small apple. You know, you know what they say, apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? So a small the apple has about 25 grams of carbs. That's about 100 calories. Uh, but where, where are the carbs at? Well, they're in the apple. And when we eat an apple, we, we literally burn calories um, to, to digest the apple. Um, it's called the thermic effect of food. The soluble fiber in the apple absorbs water. It slows the progression through our digestive tract. So we, we, we slowly absorb, we liberate the sugar. We slowly absorb it. Our insulin levels don't spike. Our sugar levels don't spike. That fiber serves as a, as a prebiotic food for healthy uh, gut bacteria to down, downstream. There's vitamins and nutrients and all is good. We take that exact same apple and we squeeze out the exact same 25 grams of carbs, the exact same 100 calories we put in a glass. We turn it into juice. And we take that, 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 that glass over to the, to the chemistry lab and we analyze it. It's the same carbs, same calories. But now it's not in the glass. It's not in the apple anymore. And we drink it. In no way, shape, or form are those carbohydrates handled the same. Because uh, that sugar is absorbed right out of the upper part of our digestive tract. Our sugar levels spike. Um, you know, on and on and on. There's no fiber to help damp down that, that spike in sugar to lower our cholesterol, to help us lose weight, to help us feel full. There's nothing to feed the healthy gut microbiome. So it's clearly not the carbs that are the problem. It is the package that the carbs come in. And I, I think that's probably one of the most important concepts that if people could take one thing away from today, it's one of the most important concepts, concepts that are out there because, you know, when we get to the end of this list, uh, you know, it should be pretty, fairly obvious to everything that Everything on this list is plant-based. And in fact, it's been shown that a plant-based diet um, reduces your risk for heart disease by about 25%, which is about the same you see with the statin medication, right? Um, and and um, a whole food plant-based diet is, is, is about 75% unrefined carbohydrates in our diet. But that's where the fiber comes from too. So, so again, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the key here is to not not to think about our food through what our food's made out of, but to think about the, the food itself. And, and, and again, trying to eat, consume foods as close to the ground as they were grown. That, that's really the key here. All right. So we're talking about the total package. You know, there was a pro wrestler back in the day. I forget his name uh, who went by the total package. Lex Luger, right? <laughs> Lex, the total package, Lex Luger. So we could, you know, take the Lex Luger approach here when it comes right. to food. And when you're considering, well, should I eat this? Is it going to be healthy? You always want to look at that total package. That's, That's exactly. kind of the name of the game. All right. So we've got legumes. We've got whole grains. What's number three on Dr. Loomis's heart attack prevention foods list? Green leafy vegetables. Ah. And, um, you know, green leafy vegetables have a ton of health benefits. Um, so just for example, we talk about, so if you think about the risk factors for heart disease, so we talk about blood pressure, cholesterol, um, um, you know, type two diabetes. So blood pressure is a major risk factor. Um, one of the ways to lower blood pressure and prevent high blood pressure in general is, is increasing the amount of potassium in your diet. Um, so we, in fact, the ratio of potassium to sodium, we actually have a Doc and Chef episode on this. Um, the ratio of potassium to sodium is much more important than the amount of sodium in and of itself. And so and typically we need about 4,500 milligrams of potassium a day. People think about bananas. Bananas are fine. They have about 400. But that means you'd have to eat 10 or 12 bananas a day to meet your potassium needs. The greens on the top of the beets, the beet greens, 1,300 milligrams a cup. Spinach, you know, thousand milligrams a cup almost. Swiss chard, thousand milligrams a cup. Cup. So these green leafy vegetables, in addition to 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 having you know all the phytonutrients and fiber, they're full of potassium. Many of these green leafy vegetables, like kale and arugula, also activate nitric oxide. And and so nitric oxide is very important in maintaining the health of our blood vessels. And the reason is. Um, the, the, our blood vessels have an inner lining called the endothelium. It's a single cell lining. And what the endothelium does is it helps control uh, appropriately the constriction and dilatation of our blood vessels. So when we exercise, we want our blood vessels to dilate, to get more blood. Uh, when we stand up, we want our blood vessels to constrict so, so we don't pass out. So, um, and one of the things that happens um, with high blood pressure, smoking, lack of physical activity is, is this endo the endothelium can't react like it should, and especially it can't dilate like it should. And that increases pressure in, inside the blood vessel wall, which can cause it to be damaged and increases for heart disease and things like that. One of the most potent activators of 
endothelium to help it dilate a propylus is a compound called nitric oxide. And, and again, there are many of these green leafy vegetables are very potent uh, uh, activators of nitric oxide. And by the way, you know, one of the other uh, important activators of nitric oxide are beets. So we talked about the greens on the top of the beets, which many people throw away. The beets themselves are probably one of the most potent um, activators of nitric oxide. And in fact, um, there's studies that have shown for, for endurance athletes in particular that uh, loading with beets, you know, before you, before you perform some endurance activity can increase uh, performance by about 10 to 15%. Interestingly enough, also uh, beets can serve as, uh, as almost like nature's Viagra because we know now, and again, we have a Doc and Chef episode specifically about this, that, that erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine for heart disease. And the reason is, is that, that you know, when we lose the ability to dilate our blood vessels appropriately, we can't, you know, we can't attain and maintain an erection. And so beets help, help, help do that. So, um, 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 there's a, there's a lots and lots of, of great benefits from green leafy vegetables. Recent study actually just showed that um, one cup of, of green leafy vegetables a day reduces your risk of heart disease by about 15%. Man, right? No side effects there by and no, large. Exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right. Legumes, whole grains, green leafy vegetables. We've got two more still to go. What's at number four, Doc? So fruits in general, but ver berries in, in particular, right? So again, Berries, um, you know, fruits in general are good, but berries in, in particular. And so berries have, um, are very, very, other than the dark beans, are probably the most potent antioxidants out there, anti-inflammatory antioxidants. And again, so we create oxidative stress. Uh, that's a natural byproduct. We, we, we use oxygen to help generate um, uh, energy for our muscles to contract. And, and, and one of the Natural byproducts that is, is, is are, are called oxygen free radicals, which is and that creates oxidative stress. And small doses that they're, they're good. They they serve they help signal the muscles. For example, when you start to exercise, your uh, oxidative stress goes up. That sends a signal to your muscles. Hey, I'm getting ready to damage you. So so get ready to fix me when I'm done. Um, it, it also can help uh, heal wounds and and, and uh, boost our immune system in small doses. And high doses though, oxidative stress is bad. It can damage DNA, increase risk for cancer. It can damage muscle cell walls. That's why people get sore and stiff after, after physical activity. Um, but the other thing it can do, as I mentioned earlier, is it can oxidize the LDL particles, which makes them much more reactive with the, with the, uh, with the blood vessel wall. And our bodies have a very limited ability naturally to mitigate oxidative stress. And the only way you can, you can, gain antioxidant capacity is through dietary antioxidants. And again, the only place they occur is in plants because in general, these, these dietary antioxidants are the plant's natural defense mechanisms to keep them from getting you know, infected by viruses and, and, and bacteria when they get damaged. So, so and, and again, in general, the darker a food, the, the darker the food, the more potent the antioxidants. So again, that's why the dark beans, but also blue blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, um, blackberries, et cetera. Very potent antioxidants, ton of fiber. Uh, again, great for our hearts. All right, we've got a lot of questions coming in, but before we open up the doctor's mailbag, there's still one more on the top five. What is it, my friend? I would say it's soy. Um, soy? Soy, right. So soy um, um, has, has, is, is, packed full of what are called isoflavones. Uh, they've been shown to have lower LDL cholesterol, lower blood pressure, prevent heart disease, uh, and also prevent breast cancer. Again, we've got a whole Doc and Chef episode just on soy. Um, and, and, you know, some people are scared of soy. Um, you know, they're concerned it's going to cause breast cancer, but in fact, it's the opposite. Um, soy actually blocks, uh, binds weakly the phytoesters, the plant-based esters in the soy, bind weakly to the, to the breast cells, for example, and block the effect of natural estrogen. But soy, uh, now it, you also want to be careful about how you consume the soy. Um, you don't want it to be ultra processed. So, so, you know, whole bean, especially whole bean uh, soy products like, like edamame or tempeh, uh, but you know, soy milk and, and, um, and uh, tofu are fine. Uh, tofu is just, you curdle soy milk, you scrape the curds off, press in a block, that's, that's what tofu is. That's good. You probably don't want to go any more processed than that. So some of the, the fake, uh, like vegan burgers, um, they'll text, we can see textured vegetable protein, 
some of the, the soy, some of the, the plant-based protein powders have ultra processed soy. You do need to be a little bit careful with that. There is some evidence that that may activate another receptor on breast tissue, for example, which may actually increase your risk for, for, for breast cancer. So, but soy is, a, is, a, is, is great for our health overall. Um, but in particular, it's been shown to help prevent uh, heart disease. For, but there's a lot of mechanisms, again, mainly through, partly through cholesterol, lowering cholesterol and such as that. Yeah, but before anybody poo poos uh, tofu, like you can really do some incredible things. Um, I know uh, Sh Chef Karen Dugan, um, your, your, your counterpart at the Doc and Chef, she does this amazing recipe where she just chops up the tofu, basically makes it into cubes, lets it marinate for, right. I don't know, four to eight hours, sometimes overnight in the refrigerator, really lets it soak up all of the flavor, and then right. we'll put it in the air fryer, no right. oil, anything like that, and then let it roast in there for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And then when they come out, oh my God, they are the most delicious things ever. I think the one that I'm thinking of in particular had kind of a peanutty flavor to it. Right. It was so daggone good, right. Dr. Loomis. I think we made a, she made a peanut dipping sauce for it, right? Exactly. Uh, so yeah, soy is really just a sponge, right? So if you taste soy, you know, it, I mean, tofu, just raw tofu, it's it's pretty bland, right? Kind of cardboardish, but it's it, it 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 is a sponge for flavor. So it'll soak up whatever flavor you put it in. And so there's tons of ways you can you can make soy. I mean, I I sometimes just you can bake it, you can barbecue it, you can you can you can put it in the air fryer, you can put it in the stir fry. I mean, there's tons and tons of ways to use soy. And and uh, you know, it's 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 you know, two to four servings a day actually is is probably the optimum level for a woman to help prevent uh, breast cancer. For sure. And, and again, like if, if you're a painter, if you're a creative type, think about soy or tofu in particular as kind of a blank canvas. That's right. And, and you know, paint it with whatever flavor you want when you're in the kitchen That's and great, it will take it on. It's so good. That's, great. That's a great analogy, Chuck. I like that. I'm going to have to borrow that one. Thank you, my friend. It's all yours. Share and share alike. Um, so here's here's the deal. So those are the five best. Let me also ask you, though, about some of the, the worst. And I think back to... And I've never told this story on the show before. I was at a steakhouse one time uh, before, you know, losing all the weight. And the waitress was actually someone who I went to high school with. And after I placed my order, she said, well, you know, more people have a heart attack after eating steak and potatoes than any other meal. Right. Now, I was equal parts offended and motivated to take up that challenge to prove that I could kill this porterhouse without <laughs> killing yourself, <laughs> killing myself. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm just curious, have, have you heard that? Is there anything to that notion or was this person just kind of needling me for, I don't know, whatever reason that day? Well, I mean, we know that a high fat meal is not good. And again, part of it has to do with dysregulation of the endothelium's ability. So if you've already got heart blockage there and all of a sudden you dump all this saturated fat and now all of a sudden your endothelium can't work. And, and, you know, you, you go outside and you climb up a hill or climb some stairs and your blood vessels can't dilate. Next thing you know, you're having chest pain, you can have a heart attack. Right. Um, there, there's a so. So, again, if you if you go down the list of the bad foods, it's it's uh, probably the worst is processed meat, um, uh, you know, bologna, uh, bacon. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. There's there's a lot of reasons that 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 can occur. There's some so red meat in general, processed meat is even worse. Red meat in general, though, um, and again, it's the saturated fat. Also, we know that heme iron is a very potent. We talked about antioxidants. Heme iron is a very potent pro-oxidant. So those are those are those are um, foods that make whatever oxidative stress we have even worse, right? And so um, heme iron is the type of iron that we see in. In, in red meat and people think, well, I, you know, I, I got to eat red meat because I got, or I'm going to get iron deficient. Um, and, and again, that's a, that's a fallacy because, um, you know, it is true that, that heme iron is very easy for our bodies to absorb, but too much heme iron, again, markedly increases your risk for heart disease um, and heart attack. Uh, there is iron in plants, but it's not bound to hemoglobin. It's non-heme iron. And so um, it is a little more difficult for our bodies to absorb the non-heme iron that you find in plants. However, if you co-ingest it uh, with a source of uh, vitamin C, um, you'll see iron, iron absorption rates um, um, uh, just as good as that is heme iron without the, the heart attack risk. Um, saturated fat in general, you know, so, so um, you know, many of the seed oils, especially things like corn oil, um, you know, are very 
um, are, are bad for our hearts. You know, we perceive that uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast and salmon is, are, you know, are good. They still have a fairly significant amount of of, um, of saturated fat. Now, it is true that omega-3 fatty acids can help protect us from heart disease. And it's true that some of the fatty fishes do have more omega-3s. But again, there's all that also comes with a serving of saturated fat. And when we talk about fatty fishes, you know, most of them are contaminated by mercury and, 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 and you know, um, um, microplastics and, and all kinds of forever chemicals. Um, and, and it's also true that one of the other risk factors for heart disease and inflammation is the overconsumption of omega-6 fatty acids. And so um, the primary source of those are, 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 are meat and dairy. And so dairy is another thing very high on the list, uh, just under the meat. Um, and so we need about a, a dietary ratio of about three to one, somewhere in there, of omega-6 to omega-3 you know, standard Western diet, 50 to one, even an unhealthy kind of a vegan diet where you're eating a lot of vegan junk food, you can see 20 to 30 to one. Uh, because we also find omega-3s, omega-6s in many of the seed oils. Uh, corn oil, again, being the worst. So 80, 83 to one ratio around somewhere in there, of omega-6 to omega-3 in corn oil. They often add corn oil to cattle feed to fatten them up quicker. But even things like olive oil is still 13 to two. And so you'd have to be a little bit careful with, with 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 using oil in general, uh, but particularly the the oils like the tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil, that's all saturated fat. All you know, there's no omega threes in there as well. So the the ways you increase your omega three intake, um, you can take um, omega three supplements, but you want to be sure they're from algal algae algal based. Um, but also things like um, you know, chia seeds and hemp seeds and, 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 and uh, walnuts, um, uh, flax seed, even green leafy vegetables have some omega-3s. So, so again, um, it, it's really avoiding the oils, the dairy, the meat, and particularly the red meat and the, the, um, and the um, uh, uh, processed meat. Those are the big ones. Yeah, let's stick with oil for a second. Emmanuel sent in a question a little bit earlier asking whether there were any oils that were in fact heart healthy. And of course, that brings olive oil into the right. conversation. That one is always much talked about. Right. Um, but then you also hear people trumpeting things like avocado oil and even some of the nut oils and, and, and sesame oil and things like that. The ones that really are getting shunned right now are the vegetable oils. So, right. I mean, is it possible to even rank them and say, well, these are at least a little bit less heart unhealthy? There, there is some evidence that, that, you know, the Mediterranean diet, which can, you know, which includes olive oil, you know, there's a heart healthy aspect to that. But, but actually, um, uh, Dr. Barnard and PCRM did a study where they looked at Mediterranean diet versus a kind of a low, low, very low fat, whole food plant based diet, and did see additional reduction in things like cholesterol, and some of the risk factors. I think part of the problem is a lot of the studies that have been done with olive oil, um, you know, are comparing them to a diet that's really unhealthy, right? So, so in other words, if, if, if the primary source of oil is olive oil versus butter and, and, you know, beef fat and lard, uh, yeah, of course, you're going to see a, a significant reduction in, 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 in heart disease risk. So there's very little research around other than this one study that I know of that, that, that PCRM uh, published a couple of years ago or a year or so ago, uh, looking at olive oil versus a true low fat, no oil, whole food plant based diet. That research just isn't out there. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, is a little bit of olive oil every now and then going to kill you? Um, no, uh, probably not. Um, do you need to put olive oil on stuff to make it healthier? Definitely not. Um, um, now, the, the, the argument around the, the other problem with oils are is that um, we talked about saturated fat, right, from meat and dairy mainly. But there's another kind of fat, which is even a worse risk factor for heart disease, and that's trans fat. And so trans fats were used for a long time in, in ultra processed foods to help stabilize shelf life and things like that. Most of those have been removed now. It's, you can't put trans fats in, in processed foods and in, in packaged foods anymore. However, um, oils have what's called a smoke point. And when you cook it, when you heat an oil above its smoke point, it, it actually chemically changes some of the fats in the oil and turns them into trans fats. And for example, olive oil has a very a relatively low um, smoke point 
Avocado oil, on the other hand, has a, a very high smoke point. Um, and so some of the, the discussions around oils are around, uh, around you know, how you're using them, what temperature you're cooking them in, how you can make them more healthy by using, say, avocado oil if you're going to fry foods. But again, um, you know, that's kind of which one is less bad for you, right? It's not which one is good for you, because because I would argue that really there's no oil that's abso that absolutely is good for you. Um, mm. There's probably some that are less bad. And if you if you if you choose to cook food at a high temperature and you know you want to fry it, then you should probably use an avocado oil. But a better choice is to use an air fryer. And again, we have a whole we have a whole Doc and Chef episode specifically on air frying and and this this whole this whole discussion around around um, around fats. So l let me ask you this: You go to a fast food restaurant. It's not uncommon to take a look at the grill, take a look at the uh, French fryer, and to see smoke rising off of the top. I'm not talking about steam. I'm talking about actual smoke. So that then is a real. That should be a big signal to us, like, hey, this is really not something that's going to make your heart happy. Right. Right. Well, that, okay. that's a, that's a true statement. There's okay. probably nothing in McDonald's going to make your heart happy. It may be the, the wilty tomato, the wilty uh, uh, lettuce and tomato that's on top of the burger. That that's really about it. Because even even the condiments, right? Uh, even the ketchup is chock full of, of of sugar and on and on and on. So so there's really probably nothing. Um, good for you at McDonald's, maybe the salad without the dressing. <laughs> great, great point, though, because Annie is wondering whether refined sugars like those that are in the ketchup and condiments, are those actually un, uh, unhealthy for the heart? They are. And and again, so, so when we talk about heart diseases, so heart, people don't just wake up with heart disease one day, right? So the, the, there are multiple risk factors for heart disease. And so, again, I think this is a good, another example. We talked about nutritional reductionism a minute ago. You know, we, we, we practice health reductionism as well, right? We treat, you know, so, so think about the risk factors for heart disease. So it's high blood pressure, it's high cholesterol, it's insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, it's obesity, it's, it's a sedentary lifestyle, um, you know, there is a genetic component and you know, a smoking, things like that. But in general, as a physician, you know, I learned to treat all of those things separately. So I treat, I would, I learned to treat people's blood pressure different than their type two diabetes, different than their cholesterol. You know, there's a pill for this and another pill for that. But if you flip this all upside down, um, you know, at if, if the fundamental level, all of those things are foodborne illnesses driven by the food that, or lifestyle related in particular, but driven mainly by the food we eat, but also by how much we move and how much we stress and how much we sleep and, you know, whether or not we smoke and how much alcohol we drink. And so, so, so we know that refined sugar, you know, again, part of it's a substitution effect. When we're getting, we're reading white flour or sugar, what are we not getting? We're not getting fiber, right? We know that fiber across the board reduces all of those risk factors. And we know refined sugar um, um, increases our risk for insulin resistance. It's also the fat. I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions around insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes isn't, doesn't come from carbohydrates and sugar, although it, it plays a role. It mainly comes from fat. Um, you know, insulin is a key that unlocks the door to let the sugar into our muscle and liver cells so we can store it for future energy. And when we get fat deposited in the muscle and liver cells, it jams up the lock from the inside. So insulin can't unlock the door. So the sugar starts to rise in our bloodstream. We have to make more insulin. And then when we eat these ultra refined foods, like the white flour and the sugar and these, these heavily sugared condiments, um, that even in and of itself, even we need even more insulin. And so that puts a, a tremendous strain on our pancreas. And over time, our pancreas keep, can't keep up. That's what we call type 2 diabetes. But even people with prediabetes, even early insulin resistance, have a, have a significantly increased risk for heart disease. So Again, I don't think we can isolate, you know, one of these risk factors. They're really all the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And look, here's the thing. Risk factors, heart disease, heart attacks, certainly not limited to just the U.S. I mean, this is a global issue. Global, that's right. And that's why I'm really excited that we have so many people tuning in from around the world right now. Igwe is watching in Nigeria. We have uh, Caro, who's watching in Kenya. Elaine, who's in Scotland. Aaron is in New York. Maddie in Melbourne. Uh, Lynn in Rochester, New York. Tofu Tuesday checking in from sunny Phoenix, which I'm jealous because it was just sleeting outside my window yeah. here <laughs> south of D.C. Uh, Camilla is in Norway. Uh, but going back to Scotland, you know, just kind of a question question for Elaine. I can't imagine that haggis 
I believe, which is one of the famed meats of Scotland, is going to do your heart any favors either. <laughs> it's not a it's not a it's not a meat, Chuck. It is the um, it's ground up uh, tip classically uh, sheep lung and sheep. You know, it's kind of the parts of the sh sheep historically that no one wanted to eat. So they ground it up, mixed it with some spices, stuffed it into a sheep's stomach and uh, and cooked it. And that's what haggis is. Yes. Uh, I, believe uh, it or not, I have actually, back in the day, way long time ago, I, I actually had some haggis in, in, in Edinburgh. Um, yeah. So. You're a brave soul. I just, <laughs> yes. I mean, that sounds worse than bologna to me. And God right. only knows what they put in bologna. Um, right, right. My goodness. So that's, uh, it's, you're right. I mean, it's kind of like sheep bologna. Is what yeah. Is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, question from Pete, wondering whether white meat causes as many heart attacks as red meat. We all have that perception, or a lot of us do, that white meat is the healthier choice. Well, again, we're, we're, this is more of a question, is it healthier or less bad, right? <laughs> um, um, and, and we know that, that white meat consumption significantly increases risk for heart disease, maybe not as much as red meat, but, but it's, not, it's, it's not a negative risk factor. Because, again, if you look at, at the, you know, things that increase your risk or things that decrease your risk. Yes, white meat increases your risk for heart disease, right? I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, so it may not be as much as, as red meat, but it's not a negative risk factor like the foods I went through or the five foods I mentioned earlier, all of which are clearly negative risk factors, right? They clearly reduce your risk for heart disease. So depending on how badly you don't want to have a heart attack, right? I mean, you know, um, I think Dr. Greger uses the analogy. I mean, you know, if, if you wake up every morning and you bang your shin with a hammer, um, you know, is the answer to, you know, take some Tylenol and just hit your shin twice a week instead of every day, right? How about we stop banging our shin with a hammer? Because every time we eat white meat, we eat red meat, we eat a piece of cheese, we you know drink a glass of milk, uh, we are literally taking a hammer to the endothelial lining of our heart, right? And so, you know, again, is hitting your is hitting it ten times a day uh, uh, worse than hitting it five times a day? Yeah, it is. Is 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 not hitting it at all better than hitting it five? Of course it is, right? So, so again, I, I think that um, um, I, I think sometimes we think about this the wrong way, right? So. You know, what we haven't talked about yet, uh, Dr. Loomis, is eggs. And I think back to another one of the episodes that you did on The Doc and Chef, where we really looked at eggs and Karen whipped up uh, an incredible like homemade just egg yeah. substitute where she actually ground up the mung beans and made just egg, the same kind of thing that you would get in the right. stores, but made it in uh, the in the shop there at the Center for Plant-Based Living in sure. St. Louis. Uh, eggs and heart attacks. Some people say eggs are super healthy. Some people say they are to be a Avoided. What does the science say to you, sir? So, so there is a lot of controversy around 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 egg consumption. So, we, we, so particularly around the effect it has on dietary cholesterol. So, so it, it is clear that the dietary cholesterol can raise our cholesterol levels a little bit. What's not clear, what's less clear, is does that increase in dietary increase in cholesterol from dietary cholesterol significantly increase our risk for, for, for heart attacks. And there's some evidence that suggests it does, there's some evidence that suggests it doesn't. Um, however, um, you know, I, I think, again, I, I personally think we should think about our food as we think about the way we think about money, right? So if you have 100 calories to invest in your health in the moment, and, and what you're looking for, the investment you're looking for is not having a heart attack and not having a stroke and not getting diabetes and not having cancer. You know, that's that's our long term. That's that's what we're looking for um, over the long term. Um, and we can invest that hundred calories in because, you know, when we invest money. We're looking at a positive return on investment. So nutrition, our nutrition, I mean, nutrition return on investment is exactly that is reducing our risk for these, these chronic diseases. So if you have 100 calories to spend right this minute, you can spend it on olive oil. We already kind of talked about that. You can spend it on an egg. You can spend it on boneless, skinless chicken breasts. We, we kind of talked about that. Or you could spend it on, on you know, beans and lentils, right? What does your nutritional return on investment look like for each of those, those you know, for each of those? So 100 calories of olive oil is a little less than a tablespoon, right? And what do you get back from that nutritionally besides fat? Well, nothing, right? There's no fiber. There's no protein. 
There's no cancer fighting fight. There's a few antioxidants, but not very many. Um, and, and, you know, there's 125 calories per tablespoon of, of oil. Um, so in fact, oils in general are probably one of the worst return on investments you can make. And I don't care what kind of oil it is, right? So what about an egg? You know, 100 calories of egg has some protein, has a little cholesterol, but what else does it have? Nothing, right? There's no fiber. There's no cancer fighting phytonutrients. There's no antioxidants. And in fact, people don't realize uh, half a stalk of broccoli has more protein than an egg, right? Um, you know, there's eight grams of protein in a half a stalk of broccoli. There's six grams in an egg. And what else are you getting? You know, what are you not getting when you eat the eggs? You're not getting the fiber and the cancer fighting phytonutrients. So again, not a great return on investment. What, what about 100 calories of chicken breast? You know, what are you getting? You're getting protein. You're getting some fat. What are you not getting? You know, there's no, there's no fiber. There's no cancer fighting phytonutrients. And in fact, whether we're talking about an egg or boneless, skinless chicken breast, you know, the animals have just served as the middleman for the nutrition, right? So they've already used all the good stuff. They, they've already used all the fiber and cancer fighting phytonutrient antioxidants to run their own machinery. They concentrate what's left into protein and fat primarily, which we then consume. Now, you know, six, eight, 10,000 years ago, our ancestors probably had a survival advantage to having access to this kind of pre-digested, pre-concentrated animal fat and protein because our ancestors needed to get big and strong and, and get away from leopards and find the mate and pass on their DNA before they died of some infectious disease when they were 30. So they never had to worry about it. if I overconsume the fat and the protein that comes from animals, am I going to have a heart attack or a stroke or get diabetes because they were already dead? And we've unmasked all of that since as we've extended human life expectancy. And, and, and because most of us are no longer starved for calories, we have this luxury of skipping the middleman, right? We can go straight to the plants because all the protein in an egg or a chicken breast or a piece of steak, where did it come from? It came from the plants that those animals ate primarily, right? So, and, and by the way, you know, 100 calories of, of chicken breast is about an ounce. So think about how much space that's going to take up in your stomach. Think about how much space that oil is going to take up in your stomach or that egg is going to take up. What about 100 calories of beans, lentils, broccoli? You know, we're talking eight to 12 ounces, right? That's a lot of beans and broccoli. So you're gonna be full. What else are you getting besides the protein? You're getting fiber, cancer-fighting phytonutrients, on and on and on. So that is why these plant-based foods are such a such a amazing investment that we can make in, in, in our future. I mean, think about it, Chuck. We're coming into football bowl season and the Super Bowl's coming up in a couple months. You know, you, you turn on a ball game and you open a bag of Doritos. How hard would it be to eat a thousand calories of Doritos when that game's over? That's just the hard. first half, bro. That's exactly. just the first half. Exactly. Come on. Think about how, you know, how long would it take you to eat a thousand calories of blueberries or broccoli? It'd take you a week, right? It's like 10 pounds, right? All so day. again, it, it's, you know, th these plant-based foods become calorically self-limiting, right? So, so you can't overindulge in blueberries uh, for the most part, right? You can't overindulge in broccoli. So, so again, you know, that's why I think if we, if we really, if we really dig down and, and think about the package that our food comes in, you know, that's really the key here. The total package. All right, let's grab a couple of more here before we uh, take things home. Uh, let's start with Marsha. And I think that this is a really pertinent question to what it is that we've been talking about all day today. Marsha at 1237 says, I've tried to discuss a plant-based diet with my cardiologist, but she's more interested in statins. How do I find a cardiologist who will support a focus on diet rather than just on drugs? Yeah. So unfortunately, um, you know, that, that's a big issue. And, and Kim Williams, the past president of the, of the American College of Cardiology, has said there's two types of cardiologists. There's, there's ones that are plant-based and there's ones that have not read the science. So, uh, so, so you're, you're spot on there, Marja, that, that it is important. Um, there are a couple of good databases um, that, you know, there's some fine plant-based doctor databases. PCRM has one. Um, the Plantrition Project um, um, has one. And so if you just Google plant-based doctor directly, you can put in your zip code, you can put in your, um, um, you know, the specialty you're looking for, and it'll help identify, you know, plant-based doctors in the neighborhood. And I can tell you, you know, here in Washington, D.C., um, uh, there's two that I know of. There's one down in Fredericksburg, which is a, you know, couple hour train ride away. And then there's one in the suburbs of D.C. But even here in D.C., you know, there's only two doctors that I know of that, that really truly advocate for a whole food plant-based diet. But again, there, 
I think that's changing. I think more and more doctors are starting to come around and understand the fundamental importance of a plant-based diet, and especially in heart health. And so I, I would just suggest you, 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 you go online and you Google plant-based doctor directories. And whether you're looking for an OB-GYN doctor, or pediatrician, you know, primary care doctor, um, those are great resources. All right. Uh, Weiss, 1233. Avocados, are they healthy? I used to eat a lot of olive oil with avocados, nuts, fish, fruits. My LDL went to 102. I was expecting a lot lower number right now. I eat mostly plant greens and egg whites. So that's a great question. So avocados, you know, uh, can can be part of a healthy diet, nuts as well, right? But the problem is uh, with, with both nuts and avocados, um, they, they do have a lot of fat. And so what I usually recommend for patients who, who have, are trying to really get their, their cholesterol under control. So, so when we talk about LDL cholesterol, you know, optimally it should be less than hundred. Ideally, if you really want to minimize your risk for heart disease, it should be down in the middle, you know, less than 70, 75, somewhere in there. So people that struggle with high cholesterol, and there is a genetic component to this. There is, there is a genetic, uh, about 10, 15% of the, of our cholesterol risk comes from, from family, uh, from DNA. Um, but you do have to be careful about, and especially people who have insulin resistance. So type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, prediabetes. You have to be careful not, so it's not only the type of fat you consume, but the quantity of fat. And so I usually recommend trying to keep your total fat intake, whether it be from nuts and seeds or avocados, which are, which are healthy fats, to no more than about 30, 35 grams a day. Uh, and then you want your fiber intake to be 40 to 45 grams a day uh, or higher than that, right? So oftentimes what I'll do is, um, is I'll have patients spot check their diet. They're, I use, an, there's a lot of apps you can do it. I, I like Chronometer, it's called, it's C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. It's very tedious, uh, but, 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 but keeping a 24 or 48 hour food diary, uh, I like Chronometer because you can save recipes, you can just cut and paste recipes, it'll calculate all the nutritional values. And just see where you're at. And I can tell you, I, you know, I live and breathe this stuff. And about once a quarter, I do chronometer just to recenter myself. And I am almost always amazingly disappointed at the disconnect between what I think I'm doing and what I'm actually doing. And the thing that gets me in trouble is exact. It's nuts and nut butters, right? So say I want to have a snack in the afternoon. And I, around, Trader Joe's has these little brown rice cakes, which are perfectly fine, you know, fibrous, little peanut butter. You want to be sure you get the one that doesn't have it's just peanuts or you don't want one with palm oil which is added oftentimes as an emulsifier because we mentioned earlier tropical oils are not good for you you know a little peanut butter um you know maybe some apple cut up maybe a little cinnamon perfectly healthy snack right well i get the peanut butter out right a big spoonful for me a spoonful for the cracker another spoonful for me well that's two-thirds of my fat just like that right w without even thinking about it uh, just the other day, uh, a couple, I have two sons that live here in town, and we were going to have a taco party. And I and I made a, uh, um, I, I wanted to make a, a chipotle cashew crema, right, nice. to, to drizzle on the tacos. Um, and you know the amount of fat in that from the cashews is for a little drizzle, you know, minimal. So I get my Vitamix out, and I get the cashews out. Handful for me. Handful for the blender, handful for me. Again, two thirds of my fat intake. So, so again, you know, um, avocado is the same thing. You know, if it was up to me, I could take, a, I could eat a whole huge bowl of, of guacamole. I could just take a whole avocado and fill it full of hot sauce and eat with a spoon. Probably don't want to do that, especially if you if you if you tend toward higher um, uh, to, to toward higher cholesterol, or especially if you've got you know insulin resistance. You know, you you want to treat avocados like you would a condiment. Right. So so, you know, a, a couple slices on a, on a on a bowl or in a salad or on a burrito, perfectly fine. But again, it needs to be in the context of limiting your overall fat intake to probably no more than about 30, 35 grams a day, somewhere in there. Yeah, I hear you say you probably don't want to do that. But then there's also that part of you that says, yeah, I, I, I really do. Yeah, I really do. They're, they're so daggone tasty. Okay. Uh, last question. I want to give this one to a first timer who, uh, who's able to join us live. Annette at 1215. Thanks for patiently waiting. Uh, wondering about their own heart health. Wondering whether it's better to first get a calcium score test or a stress test. Not sure why they would be looking to get these, but by and large, is yeah. it possible to wait which is more important? Sure, sure. So, um, so, uh, so a for those who don't know, a stress test, there's different kinds, but the typical stress test is an exercise stress test where you put someone on a treadmill, you hook them up to an, an EKG and you have them exercise till you can't exercise anymore. 
and you monitor the, the for changes in in in, in the EKG. Uh, normal heart muscle conducts electricity in a certain way, and when when if you were to have some blockage, uh, and all of a sudden you're not getting enough blood supply to the muscle, it changes the way that that the electricity is conducted. And you can see that on an EKG. The problem is you have to have about 60 to 80 percent blockage um, uh, to fail a stress test, right? Um, so. So you could have 75% blockage and be in pretty good shape and, and still pass a stress test. Now, the good news is if you pass a stress test, the likelihood you're gonna have a significant heart is it, event in the next couple of years is, 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 is reasonably low. Um, but there are some patients who have a strong family history um, and, and or, you know, or they've got a lot of risk factors and where we really wanna be very careful about, you know, getting their cholesterol down, you know, pretty low. And sometimes it's just not possible to do with with diet and exercise. I'm, you know, I'm I'm not anti-statin, but I I mean, uh, but everyone, you know, I mean, I do use lifestyle lifestyle um, um, primarily. But there are some patients who who actually might benefit from 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 statins. And so, um, a coronary calcium score. Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, when when we start to develop plaque or blockage in our in our arteries. Um, you can think of it as almost like a scar that's forming in the in the in the in the subendothelium just below the endothelium, and and as that progresses or matures, um, that scar, if you will, that plaque will start to calcify, and it turns out you can actually measure the amount of of, of calcium um, that's present in the coronary arteries, and so that's what so that's a coronary artery calcium calcium score. It's the test is what we're talking about here. And it's, it's done uh, with a, with a modified CAT scan, limited CAT scan. Now it doesn't tell you how much blockage you have. So it doesn't say, Oh, you've got 50% blockage in you know, your left anterior descending artery, but, but it, it measures what's called a pl the plaque burden. And there is solid evidence that, that the plaque, the, the level of your calcium score directly correlates to your risk of having a heart event in the, in the next, you know, five years. Um, and so um, I typically use calcium scoring to re-stratify patients' risk. And I'll usually do that first. If they're not having symptoms, I will usually do a calcium score first. Because if your calcium score is zero, then you don't need to get a stress test or if it's very low. If, it's, if your calcium score is very high, then we might move you know, send someone to see a cardiologist, they might need a stress test at that point, if, you know, if your calcium score is four or 500. Um, so that's how I use it. So I, because I think some patients are, are under, so if you, there's risk scores you can do, you can, you can enter in, you know, age and gender and cholesterol numbers and whether you smoke and what your blood pressure is, it'll calculate what your heart risk is. And that's how we've traditionally determined if someone needs to be on a stat or not. I think there are some patients who, you know, for example, you follow a plant-based diet, you've got a little bit of a family history, but you exercise and you're not obese and you don't smoke, but you put your numbers in, you know, your cholesterol's, but despite all that, your cholesterol's still running a little high. Maybe there's an element of familial hypercholesterolemia. The numbers might say go on a statin, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I don't think that may, that might not be necessary. So I'll do a calcium score to, to see if they've been over, if their risk has been overestimated. And then there's other patients who, who, um, whose risk might be underestimated. You know, everyone in their family died of a heart attack when they were 40 and they've got say insulin resistance and all that, where we might want their lipids to be down in the sixties and we can't get it below 110, which might be okay for some people. Um, oftentimes I'll use a calcium score to, to be sure they're not being under, the risk isn't being underestimated. That's how I personally use um, the calcium score. I think, you know, any test I order, I, I like to think through what am I going to do with the results? And if the, if the answer is I'm not going to do anything with the results, and I typically won't order the test. But but again, if, if I use it as in the decision tree to, to start whether or not to, to start statins, typically, um, um, there, there are other uses of it um, that people use, but that's how I use it in my practice, you know, in a, in a per, from a preventive kind of standpoint. All right. Now, here's the deal. Uh, you can schedule an appointment to visit with Dr. Loomis at the Barnard Medical Center. Do it in person in Washington, D.C. Telemedicine visits also available in select states. Log on to barnardmedical.org. I know that your patient calendar is ultra full, uh, yeah. but you, sir, are definitely worth the wait. So barnardmedical.org to schedule your appointment today. And then uh, coming up December 14th in St. Louis at the Center for Plant-Based Living, you are going to be putting on your Doc and Chef hat uh, right. with Karen Dugan going to be having the healthiest ugly sweater Christmas party <laughs> ever. Right. 
Yep. Uh, and and so I just I brought this. I actually got this sweater the last time I was out <laughs> your way uh, over the holidays, and I just wanted to hold it up because. I just want confirmation that this may be the ugliest Christmas sweater that you have ever seen. You know what, Chuck, you might win the prize. Thank you. I mean, you're not even going to be there. You might win the prize. That is a pretty ugly sweater, I have to admit. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, though. This guy kind of looks like the old me with the yeah, Santa hat no, on, you know? Good, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so, it's yeah, just a reminder know, how far we've come in life. That's all. That's exactly right. And I, and I promise you, you know, in addition to being amazing food, you know, it'll probably be the most educational dinner party you've ever been to as well. And not only is it a lot of fun and the food is absolutely amazing, um, you know, and you, and you don't have to cook, you don't have to clean up and you might learn something. Right. So absolutely. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and uh, pull up the um, the menu for the Christmas party. There it is right there. This is what uh, Chef Karen Dugan is going to be whipping up there. Look at this. I mean, this is just off the charts right there. There's a link, by the way, to sign up uh, right now in the episode notes. You get a bargain for the price. You get the education, plus you get the dinner. And oh, by the way, uh, you know, everybody's wearing an ugly sweater. I mean, I might send this one out there your way. I don't yeah. know if you would wear that that night, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like that, that so, poor yeah. sumo wrestler needs a name. There we go. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I mean, just a, a fantastic menu. And I see like chick, chicken parm is on there uh, with pasta. And it just it never, you know, ceases to amaze me how fun eating a plant based diet can be and how creative you can get in the kitchen to replicate all of your old favorites. So, you know, we talked about taking a lot of stuff off of the plate today, but it doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice the flavor that you've grown right. up with That's exactly, at all. Yeah, exactly you're right. And, you know, you can also learn more if you come over to the dockandchef.com. Um, you know, Karen and I started the Doc and Chef um, earlier this year. Um, and, and it was really, you know, we were getting the same questions over and over. Like, you know, where do you get your protein? She's getting it from a nutrition standpoint. I'm getting it from a health standpoint. Where do you get your protein? Is soy good or bad? What about gluten? So, we, you know, one day we're, we were at a conference uh, speaking and, and light bulb. Why don't we start a YouTube channel? So we did. And these are short 10, 15 minute videos where we marry the nutrition science to your plate of food. And, and your you, Chuck here is our, is our producer, editor, man in charge, the boss man, we call him. Um, and each, each episode, I write a scientific blog post that has all the evidence and all the, re, the, the research um, the links to it. So it's really, um, um, we've gotten some great feedback from patients and, and people in the community um, about how, it's, it's almost people call it um, edutainment, right? So um, Karen and I have kind of a unique, um, um, in, um, um, we, we get along well together and, 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 and um, we have a lot of chemistry. And, and so I think you'll enjoy it and, and a new episode every couple of weeks. And um, um, so stop, come over to the, to the Doc and Chef and, and for some fun edutainment. Edutainment, my friend. There's a link to that also in the uh, show description and in the episode notes right there. Uh, Dr. Loomis, man, thank you for your time. This has been a lot of fun. And just recapping for those of uh, you who joined us a little bit late today, the five foods, the five biggies for lowering that risk of a heart attack, legumes, whole grains, green leafy vegetables, fruits, especially berries, and then soy right? Stop shaming soy. Bring soy into your life. You will be just fine, my friend. Dr. Loomis, you are more than fine. You are tops, my friend. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Happy holidays to you, Chuck. Happy holidays to you, my friend, and to the crew behind the scenes. Thank you guys so very much for making the magic happen. And to you exam roomies, thank you for all of the wonderful questions and raising your health IQ right alongside of us. And for everyone at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.